And so in this session, I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me again to Romans chapter 1. And I want us to look again at these opening verses of this book in the Bible that is Paul's theological presentation with all of its depth and profundity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he makes this very known at the very outset of these opening verses. To bring to your, to your attention, uh, this word gospel is found in verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And that flags our attention at the very outset of this book, that this is a book about the gospel of God. We noted that this is the source of the gospel. It is the gospel of God. Uh, it's a subjective genitive, meaning that God is the source. God is the uh, origin or the originator of this gospel. It has come down from above. It is not originated in the, the mind of man. It is not man's attempt to commend himself towards God. It is God's uh, proclamation, the means by which he will receive sinners to himself. And so we noted the, the source of the gospel is God Himself. This is God's gospel. This is God's solution to the human dilemma. This is God's way of salvation. We noted second that the exclusivity of the gospel, uh, the definite article in front of gospel, the gospel should leap off the page to us that this is the one and only gospel that there is. There is no other gospel proclamation but this one that is revealed to us in pages of Scripture. In fact, we see that definite article used in verse 9, the gospel of His Son, verse 15. Uh, the gospel, I was eager to preach the gospel. And then in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. In each of these instances, the, the definite article, the, is used to define the exclusivity of this message. And that is why we have to go preach the gospel far and wide. That is why, uh, as providence would permit and doors would open, that we should go even overseas and in those places where the name of Christ has not yet been named, for there is... There is no other way of salvation but through this gospel. And for those who die without hearing the gospel, uh, they will perish forever in the flames of hell because they are sinners like anyone else is a sinner. Even those who hear the gospel, uh, the, the flames of hell below is their just punishment. And so therefore, we must go to them and bring the gospel to them so that they may be saved. And Paul is making that point loud and clear, and he will reinforce that in chapter 10. For how can anyone be saved except they hear? And how can anyone hear except the preacher be sent? And how beautiful are the feet of those who carry glad tidings. And then third, we noted, as we continued to look at this, we noted in verse 2 the promise of the gospel. Uh, Paul writes that, it, that God promised this gospel beforehand through His prophets in the Holy Scripture. And that in one way or another, the entirety of the Old Testament is a finger pointing ahead to the coming of Christ and the declaration of His atoning work upon the cross. Uh, this word gospel, euangelion, means good news. It means good report, good tidings, good announcement. When William Tyndale translated this into the English language, he defined it as glad tidings. It was a common word in the first century that was used in the culture, especially in the Roman Empire, to describe the pronouncement that would be made by a herald who would be dispatched from Caesar's throne 
And he would be entrusted with a message, and the message was a, mis- a message of, of victory and of triumph. For example, that the empire had conquered a, a surrounding nation and have now annexed and absorbed that nation into the empire, and now the empire has, has won a great victory on the battlefield. And so... Heralds would be dispatched to go to the four corners of of the empire and they would go into a village and gather a crowd around them and they would lift up their voice and cup their hands and they would make a proclamation that Caesar has won a great victory on the battlefield. That is the very word that is used here. And as Rome was used to sending out proclamations of victory, Paul says, no, I have a proclamation for Rome. I have a proclamation of God's victory through His Son and His death upon the cross. Martin Luther defined this word gospel this way. The evangel, or gospel, is a Greek word and in German means a good message, a good tidings, good news, a good report which one sings and tells with rejoicing. So when David overcame the huge Goliath, the good report and the comforting news came among the Jewish people that their terrible enemy, Goliath, had been slain, that they had been delivered, and that joy and and peace had been given to them. And they sang and they they danced and were happy because of this victory. Luther then writes, So the Evangel, the Gospel of God, of the New Testament is also a good message and report. The Gospel has, has resounded in all the world, Luther writes, proclaimed by the apostles. It tells of a true David who fought with sin and death, and the devil, and overcame them, and thereby delivered without any merit of their own all those who were held captive in sin and plagued by death and who had been overcome by the devil. Jesus Christ, the greater Son of David, made them righteous, gave them life, and saved them Thus their needs were satisfied and they were brought back to God. Close quote. This is the proclamation, the announcement that God has entrusted to all whom He calls into His glorious service to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have noted the the source of this gospel. It is God's gospel. The exclusivity of it. We have noted the promise of it. And now fourth, I want you to note the subject of it. Uh, What is the unique content of this gospel? And in verses 3 and 4, we see, beginning in verse 3, that the gospel is rooted and grounded in the person and work of His own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the gospel. In fact, Martin Luther comments on this very verse. Verse 3, Luther writes, Here the door is thrown wide open for the understanding of Holy Scripture. That is, that everything must be understood in relation to Christ. Everything about the gospel must be understood in relation to Christ. The need for the gospel, the provision of the gospel, the securing of the gospel, the offer of the gospel, it is all bound up in Christ. John Calvin asserted, quote, the whole gospel is contained in Christ, close quote. He is the alpha and the omega of the gospel. He is the sum and the substance of the gospel. He is the beginning and the end of the content and the substance of the gospel. That is why Paul said, we preach Christ. We preach Christ and Him crucified. This is why Paul said, we proclaim Him. To preach the gospel 
is to preach the person and work of Jesus Christ. So, note verse 3. As this sentence continues to, to unravel and to unfold and extend itself, in verse 3 of this gospel, he begins concerning his son. I love the succinctness of that. The saving gospel concerns the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we see in verse 3, both the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. This is what makes our gospel so unique, that He was fully God, yet fully man. Not 50% God and 50% man, 100% God, 100% man. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. It concerns His Son, the divine Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon affirmed, Let this be to you the mark of true gospel preaching, where Christ is everything. Concerning His Son, that speaks of His deity, His eternality, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. He is the Son of God and the Son of David. Son of David speaks of His humanity. It is a messianic term that Jesus entered the human race through the portal of a virgin's womb and He came in the direct messianic lineage as it had been prescribed in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13. It was stated that this coming deliverer who would save His people from their sin, God said to David in 2 Samuel 7, when your days are complete, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you. There will be a greater son of David who will come, who will come forth from you, meaning from your loins, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It would not be a kingdom from which there would be a, a, a succession to another king. That when this king would appear on the scene of history, he would be a king and there would be the establishment of a kingdom forever. It would be an eternal kingdom. And this one is the son of David. In Psalm 89 verse 3 God says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Isaiah 11, verse 1, Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, the father of David. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him and this one is this Son of God, the Son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. So He would be fully God, and He would be fully man, and that would be necessary if He is to stand between God and man and be our mediator.